Welcome to this week's episode of the Rutledge Perspective Podcast. And once again, I have an amazing guest. I'm just so honored to have her on the show today. Another woman who is doing incredible work where we are in the same space, but we serve so differently. And so I think the power of having these women on my podcast is showing to all of you, there are millions and billions of people out there and there is plenty for all of us. And the way Melinda serves is just incredible. So I'm going to introduce you really briefly briefly to my guest, Melinda Benlimle, and then we're going to get started on our conversation. So Melinda has worked in human capital and organizational development for over 20 years, and she specializes in strategic planning and communications, performance and effectiveness, and change management and leadership development. She also has a working knowledge of Mandarin Chinese and Moroccan Arabic, which is just incredible. So I'm going to give you guys her whole bio when you read the show notes, but I want to take the time to really get into the conversation with her. So Melinda, welcome to the Rutledge Perspective Podcast. Podcast. Thank you, Laurel. It is great to be here. And I just have to say, when I discovered your podcast and I started listening to your episodes, I really felt a kindred spirit with mm-hmm. the way you do your work and just some of the things in life that you talk about. Um, so I'm just really pleased to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it is. It has become something that I love. I never would have thought about it, right? <laughs> that I love right. to do so. And I love talking to amazing women. And so where I'd like to start is here. So tell people a little bit about more about what you're doing now. And then I want to dive into how you got there. Love that. Yes. So right now, and now being kind of coming out of the pandemic, right? Right. Um, I've had 20 years of training and development, human capital kind of morphed into strategic planning. Mm -hmm. Um, And then once the pandemic hit, all my clients uh, were really frustrated with the quick go to work from home and now transitioning back to the workplace. And a couple of years ago, you know, George Floyd and we have DEI on the horizon again, and which seems like a pendulum that swings. And I just started asking my clients, how can I help? And over the last two years, really being responsive to that, developing online, you know, hybrid training courses, Mm -hmm. um, doing some DEI and employee engagement consulting projects. Um, Now, more recently, being back in person, facilitating leadership team retreats and seeing everybody come back into the workplace, Mm -hmm. um, not quite knowing what that really means. Are we still, are we shaking hands? Are we doing the fist bump? There's still some uncertainty that people are working through. Uh, But that's really what I get up and do every day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, having, doing that now, and especially getting through the pandemic, and I, and I do want to dig into kind of your philosophy and how you're helping people with this whole come back to work. Cause there was this whole big thing from Malcolm Gladwell, right. About you need yes. to be back at work that just blew up all over the place, but tell people, how did you start doing this? Like what made you decide to go do your own thing and start your company? You know, it's so interesting. Um, I started on my own after I saw the business that I was in and I'm in Mm -hmm. Northern Virginia outside Washington, DC. I always like to describe before I moved here about 17 years ago, my Mm -hmm. previous life was in international higher ed. Okay. So my heart is really around international cross-cultural, you know, languages. Um, But my husband moved here for a job. And so Mm -hmm. I started doing consulting around the beltway Mm -hmm. and one of, I've never been fired before and I was fired from a job Mm -hmm. and it just hit me so hard. Like my performance isn't up to par what's going on. I've never been fired before, but I was working as a contractor to a big federal contract Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I managed people on big federal contracts that I had to let go as well. And I realized, okay, this business model (laughs) If I'm going to stay in this work, I need to just accept that projects will come and go. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. one was going. And -hmm. at that point, I said, I better have something of my own in my back pocket. So I started Mm -hmm. a side hustle, right? Mm -hmm. Doing some facilitation training and and coaching and just did that side hustle until, you know, those, the scales tip Mm -hmm. until, or something happens in your personal life that tips you into leaving the security of a full, you know, paying job and going out on your own. 
For me, what tipped the scales, Laurel, was my mom became Mm. really ill and Mm -hmm. she was a few hours away from us and, you know, had a catastrophic incident Mm. happen. I moved down there to take care of her, ended up moving her back into home Mm -hmm. with us and just said to my husband, I can't do this full-time job. You know, I've got these clients on the side. He said, just quit. We'll figure it out later. Mm -hmm. God bless him. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) My mom since passed away a few years Mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. And I always say she gave me uh, a couple kicks in the pants (laughs) that I wouldn't otherwise get. One was get out there and start your own business. Mm -hmm. And two, your health. Because if you don't take care of it now, I saw what was to lie in front of me. And she had a lot of, you know, health issues that that could have been prevented. Mm -hmm. So classic story of many entrepreneurs, right? We go out because we were forced to, Mm -hmm. Um, I had the desire, but not the courage until that happened with mom. That's, that's a really good point because so many people, you know, will do a side hustle or they'll, they'll not do anything at all. Right. Because it is, it is entrepreneurship is not easy. It is absolutely not easy. It is dealing with your own head trash every single absolutely. minute. I love that. Every single day, right? I love and that. So as I was having my therapy session this morning, right? Every Monday. So it is it is really important to understand that it is not easy. So all that stuff you see on social media and everything else about how people just went out and it just happened, maybe 0.1% of people have that happen. Absolutely. What do they outliers. say about actors? You know, it takes yes. 20 years to be an overnight success. Yes, exactly. So, so listening to Melinda's story, sometimes we have to be prepared, whether it's changing a career or really going into entrepreneurship. Sometimes there has to be an impetus to kick us out of our comfort zone, because even if you're miserable, there's some comfort in that misery. It's the enemy, you know, right? Absolutely. So, so as you think about kind of this moving into, there were a few things you said, there was the, the emphasis that you had to, to kind of move, which, which happened not of your own planning. Right. But there was also this idea about your mom talking to you, not only about her health, but you getting the courage to go out. What was the real tipping point for you? If you think about and really dig into what gave me the courage to just do this? Yes. There was the other stuff that, that kind of forced my hand, but what was my internal battle to really say, no, I'm, I can do this. Right. There was a process of, um, in doing my own work, right. Mm-hmm. Developing my own, um, value, self-worth mm-hmm. confidence. And I think I just reached an age and stage mm-hmm. in life that mm-hmm. I'm not putting up with the BS <laughs> anymore. Right? I'm not working with people. I don't want to work with anymore. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I had enough of a network and mm-hmm. enough of a reputation where I could kind of Mm -hmm. pick and choose the clients and the projects that I wanted. I did have a supportive spouse and second income, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or I think Mm -hmm. it would have forced my hand in different directions. But I realized that um, and I'm very grateful for it and said, I need to do this now Mm -hmm. while we're Mm -hmm. stable and wanted the flexibility. Mm -hmm. Um, I looked in the market and looked at my offerings Mm -hmm. and figured out uh, you know, where I can go and kind of create a space for myself that I mm-hmm. feel fulfilled mm-hmm. uh, at this stage in life. Right. Yeah. And also can, where can I add value? And I tell mm-hmm. you, Laurel, I've gone through the business coaching. I've gone through a lot of processes of yes. the self and the business to land where I've landed now, but there's yeah. that internal you know, when you get connected to your value system mm-hmm. and how mm-hmm. you live your values every day right. and how you make decisions for me, I really had to practice saying no. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. until recently, it was hard to let go yes. of some opportunities and really say no yes. to open up the space for other things to come in. And I will tell you, as a business owner, you you probably have something similar. I have this yeah. huge um, paper on the wall for my six month plan. Mm-hmm. And I put sticky notes of all the projects on it. Right. So- walk in and he'll look for the first few months and then go and what's after that (laughs) but I noticed this pattern that in the next few months something else will show up yes and I've had to learn to have faith in that and it Mm -hmm. never fails me if I'm doing the right things right planting the right seeds Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. something will sprout in the next quarter it's not there on the map now and it's really scary but they seem to sprout up well and and I think 
you know, when you, when you think about that, especially for those of you who are thinking about going out as, as entrepreneurs, there's a couple of things that, that Melinda just said. And one is really getting clear on who you are. And I know that's, we talked to, that's one of the places we connected to is I work with my clients a lot on, look, it's all about who you are, where you are, what you want, what it takes to get there. There are the four questions I work everybody through, but it starts with that, who you are, that real alignment with your, as I call it, root system, right? That, that real connection to what grounds you, because from there you can move and catapult yourself to wherever. And then the second thing you said was really getting clear on the ultimate objective and then letting the how show up, right? Because we get so focused on how we're going to make this happen, how we're going to move, how we're going to, how, 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 and we get into that turmoil and then we get scared and then we get frozen Absolutely. and then we do nothing. Absolutely. Right? And so whether you're building a business or building a career, that same thing happens when you get so caught up in how you don't let the other stuff show up. And and for women, especially that saying no to stuff, if your hands are full with everything, there's no room for the stuff that's meant for you. So you got to let some of that stuff go. And you don't have to be ugly to say no. You just have to find a nice way to say, you know, I just don't think that's within the realm of the things I'm doing right now, but I can probably pass you on to someone else. And you know, Laurel, I wish I had you telling me those scripts (laughs) and statements years ago, because I think it's a skill we can learn. Yes. We need to write down what those phrases are, identify those moments of fear Mm -hmm. and imagine, okay, what am I going to say if this happens? How yeah. might I tell this person no? Mm-hmm. And actually practice it, you know, put yes. our brain through the motions, yes. visualize it, if you will, our brain doesn't yeah. know the difference, right? Right. And practice those skills. And you will prove to yourself that it mm-hmm. was the right thing to do for you, because yeah. something else will come in that space. I fully exactly. believe that. Exactly. Well, and, and the other thing you talked about was, you know, as you got ready to go out, Um, And people are in many different situations, right? Some people have a spouse or a partner at home that has another income. Some don't, some have kids, some don't. I mean, you never know. So this, the thing I love about this podcast and the guests that I have on is wherever you sit, we want to honor where you are and just know where you are so you can move in the best way possible. Even if your move right now is to sit still, give yourself some grace in that so you can make a plan. But one of the things you said was, you know, I had this network. And so I was able to tap into some things and really figure out, where I could serve best. I want to dig a little bit more into that because one of the things I noticed when I came out of corporate was I had spent a lot of time helping other people make sure they were visible and learning and developing and doing all this kind of stuff. And I did some of that myself, but I, I wasn't on Facebook except for my salsa group. My LinkedIn (laughs) didn't have a picture on it right on purpose. I mean, I was truly anonymous in social media on purpose. Now, part of that was being in HR. And if you're in HR and you say HR, you know, but some of it was just, you know, I'm just wasn't trying to be out there. But as I left and started building this business, there's some downside to keeping so, so much private, right? So for you, when you think about that network, what kind of guidance would you give to somebody who's maybe, maybe not necessarily thinking about leaving, but thinking about, you know what, I'm still yes, I'm in my fifties, but I've still got a whole rest of my career to do and I'm not done yet. How do I continue to build this network so that opportunities that I may be interested in, I'm actually viable for, right? People know me, my name comes up. How did you kind of build and retain that network so that yes. it was there when you went out? That's a great question. As I look back on it um, and as I am intentional about um uh, Uh, nurturing those relationships. That's really what it's about. It's about nurturing relationships Mm -hmm. and, you know, getting curious about others, I think really helps create those bonds. Mm -hmm. You know, what questions can you ask others? And even if it's, um, you know, a phone call check-in or, um, you know, maybe we have a zoom call or Mm -hmm. I share an article or your podcast with someone Mm -hmm. I'm always thinking about, Ooh, so-and-so would like this resource. Let me reach out to them. Or did they say that their kid was doing this thing? Mm -hmm. Um, it's a curiosity about people first and foremost, and I'm introverted. I, Mm -hmm. I, 
need somebody to take me into those networking events who can do the right. glad handing and everything right? until I get to the one or two people that I am comfortable talking with. So yes. that type of networking, it is uncomfortable for me, Yes, but I found where my introversion is my strength and how mm -hmm. I can do networking that works for me. Mm -hmm. And for that, it's more on the one-on-one -on -one relationship building. Yes. And then I'm starting to kind of curate and cultivate and care for that network and those relationships mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. just to kind of keep front and center. And uh, then I started asking those questions. What do you yeah. need more of? How right. can I help? Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. People really appreciate that if you've kind mm -hmm. of laid a foundation of care, mm -hmm. right, and trust in your network, and then you mm -hmm. can be curious and ask questions and then listen, just be quiet and listen, yes. and then things will pop. Yes. I think um, so often we have a direct goal with what mm -hmm. we want out of our network and we're hard charging in that goal, yeah. right, yes. where I kind of just step back and look at it as all my, you, you're a gardener, right? It's mm -hmm. all my little flowers in my right? wildflower garden. And I just mm -hmm. want to get in there and tend them and cultivate them. Right. right. And then I kind of see what happens from there. Mm -hmm. um, so I found that, um, you know, I'll have a few folks say, you know, this is really what we're struggling with right now. And right. especially as you're not quite sure what you might be putting out into the world when you can mm -hmm. listen to where mm -hmm. the need is. Yes. You'll craft something that, that fits yes. you and fits them too. I love that because I, I'm an introvert as well and an empath. So I absorb all that energy. And the worst thing you can do for me is to send me to some of those networking things. I don't do idle chit chat at all. Right. And, and I remember I have a good friend named Hong Bauer. Um, she owns ethos consulting and she's just incredible. And one of the, she's introverted too, very introverted and has an incredible business now an executive search business. And mm -hmm. one of the things she talked about is she said, Laurel, you know, I have to walk into every one of those situations. And the question I have in my mind is, is there someone in here that I can serve? Yes. She said, That's just one person. Perspective. How do I meet the one person that I can serve? And, and, and that resonated with me too, because for me, it's all about service, right? Because when you are serving prosperity comes. So if you yes. lead with service, as opposed to lead with revenue, the yes. revenue then comes. Now you have to be mindful, right? And because you can't save your way to prosperity by any means, eventually you have to pay a bill, right? So you do have to be mindful, but there's a a mindset that is focused on service that I think helps bring some things in. You know, I'm glad you said that um, a, a phrase that I landed on for myself. And I've also used it with some of my clients who want to do bigger and better things mm -hmm. that feel risky is, mm -hmm. you know, people have the need what you have. Yes. And sometimes when I want to challenge someone, I'll say, who are you to hold back on your gifts that other people right. need? Right. Right. And right. so that, that gift of service and, you know, don't wait another day. Right. Right. People need what you have. Exactly. And even if you're in corporate, people need what you have. And so we often get, especially, especially in very old been around organizations, right? Um, it's, there's a very real solid culture that many of them are trying to change yes. that often makes it very difficult for people to show up and serve with all of their gifts and bring all of their gifts there because they don't necessarily fit the mold, right? Their idea yes. isn't what they've always done. And you will run up against those things that say, well, yeah, we want people in here who have different ideas. And then once you get there, it's like, oh, we've never done it that way. Or we haven't seen it. So that can't be possible. Exactly. And so even in those situations, you know, don't be so quick to undermine your own gifts. Find that way to have the conversation that is heard. And part of that is what Melinda said is being curious. You know, I ask the questions I ask because I'm genuinely curious about what people think, about what they feel, about how their, their perspectives are different than mine. And that genuine curiosity enables you to create really great relationships, professional and personal, right? You don't have to be best friends with everyone, but there's a connection that's created through that, through that curiosity that is very, very strong and very foundational in moving you forward whatever your ultimate goal is. Absolutely. Haven't you found that when you question people, it's almost like you have an opportunity to influence how their brain is yes. working. 
you know, just asking a question. You might not get the answer or even the result that you want right. with someone who might be a little more traditional or right. maybe afraid to do things mm-hmm. differently than the way mm-hmm. we've always done it. But just asking a question yes. and letting that ruminate in someone else's brain might be a gift for them that they might not have thought of uh, uh, your perspective before. Yes, exactly. And sometimes you get to st- to ask people questions who've never been asked, yes. who've been walking around with all these great ideas, these great thoughts, these great perspectives, and no one has ever asked them. It's like facilitation 101. Yes. The first person you focus on are the one who's not said anything. Absolutely. Right? Yes. It's not the people that are talking all the time. Yes. <laughs> right? yes. It's the ones it's the quiet who are quiet. ones. Yes. It's the ones who are quiet because one, you don't know if really they're just uncomfortable, but sometimes they know something or see something that nobody else sees that could be a turning point for that entire organization. You're absolutely right. So you want to draw that out. And so, so Melinda, then thinking about kind of how you work with people and how you move them forward and this whole idea of networking curiosity, you know, one of the things that's happening right now, and we, many of us saw this, this big backlash from Malcolm Gladwell, who is, who I'm a huge fan of, yeah. who said, it's time. Everybody just needs to go back to work. It's not productive to be working at home, blah, 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 blah. blah. And people just lost it. Right. Yeah. Um, because I think typical of us, we have swung the pendulum so far that we have a hard time getting back to the middle. And you mentioned very early in this conversation about kind of the clients you're working with and the pandemic happened and how, how are they now dealing with this getting back to work? And oh, by the way, 50% of the population is female and about 47% of the population is over 50. So how are we managing not only coming back to work and managing all those five generations at work, but also understanding how we can stop managing uniformly and manage, still manage the business because business doesn't happen. Nobody has a job but how we keep mindful of that, but still focus on managing people and helping people where they are. How are you? Don't you feel like the pandemic just um, shown a light on all of those organizational issues that we've been dealing with for decades, Yes, right? And it just this confluence of all of these circumstances all at once, I think Mm -hmm. created overwhelm for our leaders and the systems within organizations. Now that some of that seems to be working itself out, the challenges that I'm at first, I was hearing challenges like, okay, we've got this uh, work in the office three days a week policy, Mm -hmm. for example, but my uh, subordinate moved out of state. Right. You know, during the pandemic. And so you have real logistical issues of people and their families that we have to be sensitive to and work around. And at the same time, to your point, we want to leverage the diversity that we do have in organizations. But we're also dealing with, like you said, our our cultural norms, Mm -hmm. um, you know, our overworking workload is very high. Um, You know, if we don't see you, we don't believe that you're productive. We've got... um, that old school thoughts. Yeah. yeah. A lot of those traditional um, thoughts kind of come back to the surface, mm-hmm. right? Those kind mm-hmm. of unconscious beliefs that we right. have and organizations are made up of individuals, right? We're yes. not perfect, right. um, but we have to be aware of what those beliefs are so mm-hmm. that we can undo them. We can look at them and shine a light and say, how is that serving us moving forward? Yes. Um, so now I hear policies aren't being implemented equitably around an organization, right? Right. Kind of like the telework or your work from home policies. Um, You know, and I hear people um, saying, see, we proved that we could do our jobs remotely. Now, why do we need to be back in the office? Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. they they just hit on these core belief systems in organizations that when we were forced to challenge them, many people rose to the occasion. Yes, but it's still outside our comfort zone. Absolutely. And those who could shift and embrace new belief systems, values Mm -hmm. and guiding principles, they thrive. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, But there's still those organizations and maybe sometimes industries where it's just easier to say, everybody come back. Yes. Well, and, and I think putting pressure on, on leaders, especially executive leaders to say, look, the reality is you get to decide. You get to decide if you're good with remote work, then keep remote work. If you really, from a cultural perspective, you'd like to see people be honest about why, 
If it's because you don't trust people, that's something else you got to deal with. But if you really are a creative organization that feels like being in rooms, throwing stuff up against the wall, just gets you the best kind of thing. Like you're tired of the whiteboards on zoom and all of that, that you, you understand the value, but you really like that, that togetherness, just own that and be okay and understand the ramifications in the marketplace. Because again, there are millions and billions of people. There are also people who please get me out of my house and get me back to an office. Absolutely. Really we need want clarity, to be there. right? Yes. We need to identify what it is, yes. be clear about it, yes. be okay with that. And we all have choices. Now, yes. what's happened to some people is that the, the clarity, the definition of the job kind of changed on them. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, but if there's a business case for that, then leaders mm-hmm. need to kind of claim it. Yes. Right. And maybe you can move people over a bridge or to close yeah. a gap in that. Right. Um, but we have to be clear, uh, be accountable and just kind of call it what it is. Now is yeah. the time to lean into difficult conversations. Yes. Um, yes. you know, have you, have you heard of organizations and teams that, okay, now we have to be back in the office. So we all come into our office, shut the door and get on the zoom meeting. Exactly. There are other people who are on their yes. telework day. Right. Right. So we're still figuring this out, but I love your example of when we are in the office together, it's, we need to have purpose. Yes. And everybody complains about too much email uh, meetings that aren't productive. Now's the time let's it's okay. Right. Now call a timeout on that weekly meeting for a month. Zoom fatigue. Let's see if we missed it. Yes. If there's something we miss, we'll add it back in. Right. But right. we've got to have the courage to, mm-hmm. to experiment a little bit, give each other grace until we yes. find what works. And it might not work for exactly. the whole organization. It might just work team by yeah. team. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, and that, and that piggybacks into this whole idea that we're seeing now. And you, you and I've been around long enough to know this but we're seeing this whole quiet quitting, you know, people yes. are quiet quitting. I'm like, you know what? We call that retirement in place has been around for decades. There are a lot of people who only do what's in their job description. Yes. Why do you think most job descriptions now added and other duties as assigned? That's why that happened, right? This is not new. It's just all of a sudden somebody coined a term and now we're all up in arms because people aren't doing more. Let's talk about the reality of that, which is, you know, we had that big recession in 2007, 2008. Mm-hmm. We let people go. We had one person doing four jobs. Yeah. Then we kind of ramped up a little bit, but because we were capitalists, we didn't actually put more money back into hiring more people because, you know, that wasn't going to help our bottom line or the shareholders. Right. We didn't do what we said we were going to do. Yeah. So people got used to a little bit more expanded, right? Then we started adding people because we were doing pretty good. We started adding more people. But now with the pandemic, so many people quitting again, you got more people doing four jobs. Now all of a sudden, oh my God, people are quitting. Nobody wants to work. Stop. Nobody wants to work four jobs anymore. Exactly. Exactly. It's like, as you said, and I say all the time too, get clear. Let's just be real. Let's just be real. When we have someone who is, I mean, because there's so many spectrums, right? When you're talking to employees and you're talking to businesses on the employee side, you can decide if and how and when you show up. You can absolutely make those choices. You are not free from the consequences of those choices, depending on yes. the culture that you're in. Yes. Employer, you absolutely can make those determinations. You can decide you're going to have this one job that used to be done by 20 people. Now you're having two people do it. You can make that decision. But when your turnover is over, you're not free from the consequences of that decision. Okay. So it's like, how, how do we get and how do you, as you're having conversations with your, your clients, how do you have that conversation between employee and employer to say, y'all, we, we all just need to get real and some things are going to be great. Some things are going to be bad, but until you have your own business, you're going to have to deal with something that's not yours. Right. That's so right. How do you come together? That's right. uh, you know, for the employee side, and I work a lot with middle managers, mm-hmm. you know, folks who kind of feel stuck in the middle of yes. corporate or organizational policy, and they might not really buy into it, but yet they have to implement right. that. Right. Mm-hmm. And employees who, um, need to supervise staff and, yes. and might not know how to have these conversations with mm-hmm. staff. So mm-hmm. we need to help indiv- on an individual level, right? Yeah. Get comfortable with having difficult conversations, yes. owning up to our own accountability and our mm-hmm. own choices and yes. looking at some of the consequences 
you know, from an organizational perspective and senior leaders on the executive team, you know, are also afraid of having difficult conversations, but their presence has a larger impact on culture. Right. So sometimes it starts at the top, right. To shift those dynamics of it's okay to hold someone accountable. And oftentimes it's the the underperformer or poor mm-hmm. performer that gets so much attention in an organization right. to the expense of everybody else who's doing their best. Right. And so sometimes I try to point out to a manager that you need to consider all of the experiences yes. and how much energy does it take to not hold this person accountable? And you're causing so yes. much grief and damage and stress over here. So kind of yes. take a time out from the personal dynamic of having to have right. a difficult, what you call a difficult conversation. It might be right. a productive and a clarity conversation. Right. So let's do a little right. coaching around your mindset, right? Yes. Um, yes. So that we can make decisions that help the whole team and the whole yeah. organization. But it's, I think people are still kind of frayed around the edges yeah. emotionally, a little Absolutely. Uh, burn out. And so yeah. that's not the place to pull up the reservoir of, no. of energy to, have these kinds of conversations. So we have to help people kind of get back on an even uh, footing, right. To have that reservoir of um, that emotional bank and exactly to put forth in trying to solve some of these problems, but people still are kind of at, at the edges. Yeah, I agree. Everybody's tired. Everybody's worn out. Um, you know, we're, we're, we may never be done with COVID, right? It's probably going to become an endemic, as they say, like the flu. It'll just be something that happens every year. Um, and, and people are just tired, right? And so I think your point is well taken in that it's important to pause. Like I say, practice the pause, practice the pause. Give Before you say anything, some grace. practice the pause. You know, it may yes. look like somebody's being intentionally, um, uh, you know, evasive or, Mm -hmm. you know, I've heard lazy or unproductive or these things, but we just don't know someone's personal story. And while we claim kind of to your point, you know, we love diversity of thought, you know, bring the whole person to the workplace, really, you know, it, but we do need to acknowledge the whole person in the workplace. We saw kids in the back of the camera at zoom, right? We had (laughs) grief and loss that our employees are dealing with uh, on many fronts. And we still need to embrace the whole person in the workplace Mm -hmm. and lean Mm -hmm. into, you know, those conversations and what people are working with. And I think that just gives us a little more empathy and grace as we try to figure out everything else. Absolutely. And, and I think just telling the truth, right. Especially as executives. And I, I remember on, on every executive team I was on, it's like, look, we're just going to tell the truth. We're just going to tell the truth. Now, telling the truth and being transparent doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as telling everybody everything, because there's some things you just can't tell people or that people aren't prepared to be able to deal with. That's that's the truth. That's why the, the people in executive you know, levels are that. But leadership is about behavior, not about position. Yes, and absolutely. so your ability to tell the truth may even say, you know what? You can ask me anything. I would tell this to my guys all the time when I go out and work in the plant on the plant floor, I'd go out and see them overnight. And I'd say, look, I am here as the HR person. Yes. I'm a representative of the organization, but this time is your time. And you can ask me absolutely anything. And I said this every time you can ask me absolutely anything. I will not talk about anybody else's performance. Just like you wouldn't want me talking about yours. If I don't know, I'll tell you, I don't know. And I'll find out. Yeah. And if I can't tell you, I'll tell you, I can't tell you and tell you why, but you can ask me anything, right? Those are the only parameters. And by simply starting out with that and then following up and acting the same way I said, that ability to build trust and respect was exponential. And I think sometimes our leaders get so afraid of just telling the truth yeah. that we wind up creating more drama because in the absence of information, people will make it up. Absolutely. 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 Well, and I love your perspective as a, as a leader in HR and human capital, because, you know, while we've acknowledged that healthcare providers and teachers, you know, and, and other professions Mm -hmm. have been on the front lines during the pandemic within organizations, 
HR people have been on the front lines, yes. right? Yes. From how to create a sanitary workplace to mm-hmm. managing this telework policies and right. even the technology sometimes. Um, they're yeah. my peeps. Yes. <laughs> I have a special place in my heart for yeah. HR folks who've been on the front lines over mm-hmm. the last few years. Yeah. And um, uh, it, trying to bolster them as well. And so, you know, if I could turn the question in the interviewing back on you, you know, right. I would be real curious in how, how might we create more care and feeding in the HR right. profession right now? You know, and that's really interesting. I talk to HR people all the time and, and I've got to say as an HR professional and as a certified HR professional, right, we've got a long way to go. And, and part of that is it's a profession that started at personnel, right? We started as paper pushers. I don't push paper. I've never been a paper pusher. And we need to stop allowing ourselves to be paper pushers. That's number one. Number two is of any place in the organization, any place, and I really mean any place, HR is the place that if you do not have courage, I need you to find somewhere else to be. Because not only Do you have to be able to tell employees the truth and tell them things that they may not like? You have to speak truth to power as an HR person. HR people, we don't own culture. We do not. We absolutely do not own the culture of an organization. What we own is the responsibility to give the leaders in the organization and employees the tools and the tips and the guidance they need to ensure that their behavior and their actions and their words align with the culture that they say they want to create. That's what we own. And so in order to do that, you have to have courage to say no. You have to have courage to say, you know what, this is what we said, but this is what we did. We have to have courage to say, we're not putting that communication out. We are absolutely going to say what happened and what we're going to do about it. We're going to own it. And so I think that care of HR is not only about self-care and understanding that HR people are employees too, but HR people, you got to start being grown folks. You got to start being knowing as much about the business as the business people, if mm-hmm. not more. Mm-hmm. And you've got to be willing to have, talk about difficult conversations. You've got to be ready to have clear conversations, mm-hmm. clear conversations. Because I think to your point, Melinda, we call it difficult and now everybody shies away. It's not about the difficulty. It's about the clarity. Absolutely. It's about the clarity. And so if we are willing to have clear conversations, what we're doing, why we're doing it. So even if people don't like it, at least they understand why, when it's going to happen, what we're going to do to combat something, owning when something didn't go well and how we're going to do it different. Why are we changing benefits? Why are we having people come back to work in the office? Why do some people get to come back and other people don't? Saying the things that we need to say in a way that is transparent, again, not talking about everybody's issues because you can't, but in a way that is transparent and clear can go such a long way towards not only relieve, alleviating the stress for the HR person, because you've been really clear, right? Yes. You don't have to own yes. anybody else's stuff, right? You got enough stuff of your own. <laughs> that you I have. think that's really important to clarify that, yeah. um, you know, the role, and I often look at, at HR function and individuals as being kind of the heart of the organization, mm-hmm. but the mm-hmm. way that you describe it is really like yeah. putting a mirror up to the organization in a careful and empathetic way and having the courage to say, do you see what's happening here? How might we add more clarity to this? And that takes a lot of courage, um, but I think that's the role that's really pivotal because it touches on strategy. It touches on communications, right? It really is kind of interdisciplinary um, in the role that you see yourself and others might not see you that way, but we've got to to see ourselves that way. And I think others don't see HR that way because HR hasn't been that way Mm -hmm. for decades, right? HR has been the benefits people, the payroll people. Oh, or by the way, call HR because now I'm having a difficult conversation that I should have had six months ago and I didn't want to. So now it's blown up, right? The cleanup. That's what it is. HR tends to be cleanup. And and I think one thing that came out of the pandemic is number one, yes, some burnout. Um, Absolutely. Some burnout trying to figure out how to navigate all of this with how are we going to talk to people and how do we make sure that these managers who were poor managers before the pandemic got to be worse when you have to manage people remotely and vice versa, right? Some excellent ones became invaluable during the pandemic. Yes, Having to manage through all of that, it, as you said, it brought everything to the forefront. And so one, one thing at a time. Yeah. One thing at a time. You cannot change a culture that's been around 150 years overnight. You just can't. It's like turning the Titanic. You can't. But what you can do 
is have really candid conversations with the leaders of the organizations, with the owners of the culture around where they want to go, right? Well kind of the said. work that you're doing with people, Melinda, around where is it that you're trying to be and how do we get really clear on that so we can move you into action? Right? You know, and I love how you said that because you and I both garden and yeah. um, uh, I love metaphor and I've been yes. using this kind of garden metaphor um, for a while and mm-hmm. just helping people understand, you know, and I use it for myself. What seeds yeah. do you want to plant? Yes. You know, what weeds do you have to pull? And just pause. Yeah. I love how you talk about, yeah. you know, taking the pause Yeah, uh, and doing maybe just a self-assessment or mm-hmm. within your team, just pause mm-hmm. and do an assessment. Yeah. You know, what's working well that I want to yes. water. Yes. Um, what weeds do we need to pull? We've fallen into a lot of bad habits. Let's yes. just fess up and say, yeah, okay. Um, I want to work on pulling that weed because then you give yourself space to plant some new seeds and to leverage what's working well. And so, you know, I kind of use the garden metaphor to do that with some of my, you know, teams um, Mm -hmm. and you deserve to just take, take stock and also take stock of what's been working well. Absolutely. You and I connected also on this whole stop, start, continue, right? Yes, what are you going to stop? What are you going to start? What are you going to continue? Absolutely. And I, and we both use that with people, right? I always, I always mix yeah. it up. I'm like, you got to stop. Then you do continue. Then you do start. I'm like, cause you always got to butt it up against. Did we just say we're going to continue something that's connected to a stop? That's right. That's right. Start something? You know, so we both use that in terms of forcing people to think through everything that you're doing. Just, just pause. Pause. Because you're probably doing a lot of stuff that doesn't make any sense that you don't even need to do anymore. Stop it, right? Give yourself some room. So Melinda, as we, because we could talk about this for the next four days, right? So as we begin to kind of wrap it up, um, I've got kind of three final questions for you. And the first one is, as you went along your journey, kind of moving from this international kind of education, all of that into entrepreneurship, what was the biggest learning you had around your journey? That's a really good question. Um, you know, for me, it was, you're better than you think. Mm. You know, don't yeah. listen to that negative Nelly voice, yeah. right? That's so judgmental mm. and perfectionist and all of those things. Um, yeah. In my college days, that voice wasn't there, right? I was like invincible. And Mm -hmm. somewhere over time, that voice got lodged in the back of my brain and my lizard brain. And I've had to kind of unwind it, right? Because, um, you know, what's that phrase? Don't believe everything you think. Exactly. (laughs) The biggest aha for me, especially, you know, going into different positions and Mm -hmm. having three boys and just so many things in life, it's don't listen to everything you think. You know, you are better and more accomplished than what you think. And you know what? Maybe you just have to write a laundry list down of the hundred great things that you did. Exactly. To prove it to your brain. (laughs) Right, right. That you're good. You're really good. I love that. I love that. Don't believe everything you think. Well, and then the second question is, what key piece of guidance would you give to someone who maybe is struggling with okay, what am I going to do now? There is so much stuff going on and I may or may not have a side hustle. I may or may not love what I'm doing, but I I know I need to do, I need to move. And I don't know what that looks like. What, what is the the key piece of guidance that you would give someone who is ready to just move? Yeah, no, I think a very tactical activity would be, you know, what you and I just talked about Mm -hmm. some kind of take stock of where Mm -hmm. you are and Mm -hmm. out of that clarity you don't need to boil the ocean. You just need to find what's the next best step. Mm -hmm. So I think Mm -hmm. doing some kind of self-assessment activity that gets you a little bit of clarity and then just one step, right? We're all about strategic planning and action planning and and that's great, but you don't have to have three months planned out to take the first step, right? right? And I'm a big advocate of James Clear, you know, the author of Atomic Habits Mm -hmm. and Adam Mm -hmm. being the smallest element. What's the one thing, you know, Mm -hmm. what could you do to just improve 1%? Let's just do that much. That helps with overwhelm when we're trying to make a decision. So get some clarity, do a little exercise or a worksheet and think, okay, what's one thing? And maybe I could do one thing and try it out for this month, Mm -hmm. right? And Mm -hmm. open up some opportunities for maybe what the next thing is and not give yourself so much pressure that you have to have all the answers before you take the first step. 
Exactly. Oh, I love that. I love that because we don't, we, we tend to try to boil the ocean, as you said, right? Get everything done. I know I'm guilty of that. My to-do list is never going to be to done because there's like a million <laughs> things on it, right? So we're, we're all I guilty of that, that kind of thing. Wow. So I guess the last question, Melinda, is how would someone get in touch with you? They've listened to you and they're like, oh my God, we got to find her. We need her for our organization. How would they get in touch with you? Oh, thank you. You know, my business coach keeps telling me I have to be on Instagram. I have to be on social media more. And honestly, um, I'm on LinkedIn quite often. That's my kind of social media Mm -hmm. places on LinkedIn. So Mm -hmm. Melinda Ben Lumley, just, you know, find me. (laughs) There aren't many Ben Lumleys on LinkedIn. Right. And my website. Okay. Um, cognitive agility, LLC.com. I love that. I love that. And, and Melinda has been so gracious to give us a little freebie for everyone who listens to this, this, uh, podcast. So I will also have that in the show notes for you to go download, um, her free gift for you to really, when you think about that cognitive agility and getting clear and getting ready and preparing yourself, um, this freebie that she's giving us. And for all of you who are listening to this podcast, go download it. Um, as she said, it's just one thing. This is one thing you can do to get yourself moving. Um, and she is gifting us with the, her genius in that area. And we are so grateful for that. So Melinda, I, I am so thankful for this conversation. Um, Thank you so much for spending this time. I really enjoyed it. It's wonderful to talk to you. Yeah, you too. You too. It is just such a great conversation. And for those of you listening, thank you one for tuning in. I truly appreciate every listen, every download. Please share this. If it moved you, then I'm sure it is going to move someone else. So please share this episode for someone who you know, maybe just trying to figure out what their next step is so that they can have access to that freebie as well uh, to move forward. And thank you as always for tuning in to the Rutledge Perspective podcast. I will catch you each week new episodes drop on Wednesday follow Melinda on LinkedIn go look at her stuff and follow her and and learn and absorb and get really clear on your next step we will catch you next time thank you again take care bye-bye you have been listening to the Rutledge Perspective podcast thank you so much for downloading and for connecting You can find previous episodes of the podcast on my website at laurelrutledge.com forward slash podcast. You can also find me on social media at Laurel K. Rutledge and or The Rutledge Perspective. And I'd love your perspective on the things we talk about. And if there's a specific topic you want me to cover, just let me know. And please share this podcast with someone in your village who may need this little piece of perspective today. And if you're so inclined, I would really appreciate a five-star rating and review on the platform of your choice. Apple Podcasts and Spotify reviews are particularly helpful. Thank you again for listening. Take care.